Uh, Doug and I are going to go back and forth, trade trade uh, bills back and forth, and just insight and and talk about what's going on with the legislature this year. Uh, I started out the year thinking this was going to be uh, there was a lot of talk and and uh, effort uh, about the death penalty, but uh, I don't know if that's going to happen this year. But uh, that was a bill that uh, was drafted and filed in both both chambers this year, uh, but it has not got out of committee. Uh, keep in mind that you know the legislative session is obviously still in session. Last few years, there's been changes. A lot of changes have come late. Uh, that's just uh, the way it's happened. The last couple of years, there's been a bill filed late or an amendment filed late that had a lot of impact uh, or had some impact on, on on criminal law in the last few years. We still have a lot of time left, so. Uh, if you are tracking the legislative process, keep in mind that there could be some other bills coming down the down, down the pike there. Uh, there's a criminal omnibus bill, Senate File 2382. Uh, it's, it's, it's a large bill. It has quite a few provisions in it. I want to talk about that bill first. Um, it's, it's in divisions, seven or eight divisions, and there's some unusual, not unusual, but there's some chapters. You know, I've been working for the legislature for 20 years and some chapters provisions in there that uh, we're changing that I have not I've not been in the, in some of those chapters or code provisions since in, in 20 years so there are some different uh, proposals in that bill first up there's an expungement proposal in Senate file 2382 that deals with uh, misdemeanors you can expunge a misdemeanor conviction uh, you have basically have to be criminal free uh, cr no prior criminal offenses other than traffic violations for eight years uh, prior to having that misdemeanor conviction expunged. And of course, there's always some exception. There's always some offenses that are not going to be eligible for expungement, sex offenses, OWI offenses, uh, driving under suspension offenses. And there's a, there's a litany of other offenses that are not uh, eligible for expungement. That's the first division of the bill. The second division of Senate file 2382 is, a, is, is a significant because it deals with robbery. Uh, first up, it adds simulated firearms or simulated explosives to the definition of robbery in the first degree. So if you simulate, if you have a simulated firearm, if you stick your finger in your jacket and rob, come and go, uh, that potentially could be robbery in the first degree. There is also, uh, it repeals robbery in the third degree, that section of the bill. But also, robbery in the first degree, the sentencing going forward, not for people in prison, it's going to be more like robbery in the second degree where the judge at sentencing can decide whether you're going to be, you can be eligible for parole between 50 and 70% of the sentence, just like robbery second is going forward. It's not for people in prison, currently under robbery in the first degree, but convictions after July 1st, uh, as the bill stands now, uh, it's gonna be the same procedure as robbery in the second, where a person, the judge at sentencing can decide whether a person, when a person uh, is eligible for parole within the parameters of 50% or 70% of the, serving 50% or 70% of the sentence. That's the robbery um, division of Senate file 2382. And if you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask Doug or I. What other offenses are eligible for expungement? Uh, or does it just become five years later? No, there's, there's quite a few. Oh, it's, it's quite a list. Okay, so it, so it would seem that you would want to focus well, the reasoning I think for OWI and the driving under suspension and those offenses are the enhancement. You know, if you keep getting getting enhancements, now there's ways we could probably draft this where they could go back and look that you had a OWI or prior driving under suspension. Uh, but that was that was the reasoning for not being able to expunge those offenses. Yes. That 
That's true. So, I mean, uh, there's no, there's no, that, that rationale has two problems. You know, you have a long memory, they keep that They, they just do not, I think, do not want to have someone be able to expunge an OWI offense or a driving under suspension offense. That, that they just did not want to do that under this proposal. And even if it is, yes. This is, yeah, this just applies to misdemeanor offenses, this expungement procedure, not the felony. Uh, there's, there's other, there's other offenses. There's probably, we're down to paragraph X. So it goes to A through X as far as, you know, there's 25 roughly offenses, uh, that are right now, you, you're not able to, to get expunged. The bill, division three of the bill deals with a lot of, uh, well, property crime values. So all the offenses, mainly theft, fraudulent practice, anything that has a value in it, you have to steal something worth $300 or in $500, et cetera. Those values have all been, are being raised in the bill. So like a theft fifth now, you know, I don't know off the top of my head what the, uh, what the value has to be or theft fourth, but it's, if it's $100, it's now $300. You have to commit that. You have to steal that of value. That property has to be stolen before you are, you're eligible to be prosecuted under those offenses. That's that division of the bill. The next division of the bill has to deal with revocation of driver's licenses. That, that, re, that requires a lot of maneuvering and resolutions by the legislature and a letter from the governor. But essentially, if you're convicted of a drug offense, you're not going to be able, you're not going to lose your driver's license automatically uh, under that provision. So that, that's, that provision getting, is getting repealed. So like a possession of marijuana, any type of possession offense going forward, you're not going to lose your driver's license. If you're convicted for a drug offense, if it has nothing to do with driving, it's in the bill right now. Uh, I don't know. Does that apply to the visual thing like possession of several first, second offense, third offense, or whatever the other five is? Offense? First offense for right now. Yeah. There's also two, uh, uh, concurrent resolutions that are addressing that that Republicans have filed. Uh, so it seems that they're pretty serious about uh, removing the the automatic suspension of the driver's license when tied to those. So I think it does have a pretty good chance. It still requires action by the governor. Yeah. Has all it's all connected to road funding. That's why it requires action by the governor and resolutions. Uh, that's why it's it's fairly complicated. Now we're getting into the uh, part of the bill that, you know, there's some new provisions in there uh, and changes in, in code sections that in chapters I haven't, I haven't really been into, been in the last few years. There's a new theft provision that uh, any conduct specified as theft, you know, there's like 10 different ways you can commit theft. Uh, this section allows the prosecutor to combine all those thefts into one offense. So if you commit multiple thefts in different ways there has to be some connection i'm sure to to those thefts but if you commit uh multiple thefts under different theories those can be combined into one charge of theft that's the way this provision is right now written right now <clears throat> there is a uh, provision changing i think it's connected to the iowa lottery case extends uh prosecution for fraud or fiduciary breach allows, uh, even though the, the, the statute of limitations has expired, it moves the extension from three to five years after discovery, good faith discovery of a fraud or fiduciary breach. <clears throat> there was a court case, uh, Iowa Supreme Court case, I don't know how the case, but apparently the, the use of the term victim uh, was, uh, the case was overturned because the uh, the uh, prosecution used the term victim. This code provision specifies that the, the use of the term may be used in a criminal, use of the term victim may be used in a criminal
proceeding, including trial, as long as the person, it's provable that the person was the victim of, of the case. Uh, it says that, you know, that's not, uh, the case, case can't be overturned based on that alone, use of the term victim in a, in a trial. Another provision that's been controversial, I think, uh, is this right to appeal. It excludes guilty pleas. You don't have a right to appeal after guilt. If you plead guilty, you don't have a right to appeal. That This excludes that, just direct appeal. You don't have right to a direct appeal. Uh, uh, there's a provision in, in, in the bill that uh, excludes guilty pleas. Doug, do you have any comment on that one? Or if you've, have you been to the subcommittees? I've been to the subcommittees on that. Uh, first, uh, arguably not constitutional. Uh, I think most of us would agree on that. Uh, legislators, of course, are not bound by the Constitution, and they will remind you of that. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that line many times over the years. Uh, we're not bound by the Constitution. We can pass anything we want, and the court will figure out if it's not constitutional. Uh, so that's that's number one. Um, yep, yeah, that's correct. Got to have a supermajority. I don't think that bill's going to survive in the House, but uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't write your legislators, by the way. Not a criminal law matter, but we did have a bill pass out of the Senate uh, earlier this week uh, that would require a supermajority of the justices of the Supreme Court, the Iowa Supreme Court, in order, in order to find a statute unconstitutional. So apparently the, the uh, three rings of government want to have a little overlap with one another. Um, state public defenders, offered some insight into what the ramifications of no direct appeal would be. Um, they've been very careful in how they've articulated this, but it does show up in the fiscal note. Uh, right now, about 90% of, uh, of criminal cases are settled with a plea. So if a attorney advises that someone take the plea, make a guilty plea, uh, that happens 90% of the time, but now that you are going to be telling them they have no right to a direct appeal and the sentencing comes back different than you were expecting it to come back as, and they still have no direct appeal, there's a belief that there, there will be an increase in the number of PCR actions because there's no direct appeal. Uh, they also believe that there'll be about $1.5 million both with the State Public Defender's Office for State Public Defenders and $1.5 million in indigent, uh, indigent defense contract attorney fees that are paid because of a modest uptick in the number of times counsel trying to serve the needs of their client and making sure that they don't have a uh, PCR action filed against them advise not to take the plea. So, and that's just their modest look. So there's a $3 million uh, fiscal note that's attached to this just because of the removal of the direct, uh, the direct appeal. Back to you, Joe. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I tend to agree, agree. I would agree that you know, there are constitutional issues there, but I think to the extent that uh, you're already waiving a lot of things, uh, there's a lot of incentive on a guilty plea situation um, to be very careful what you bring and save a lot, advise the client a lot of times just to go to PCR, bring what you can on the direct appeal um, and then go to PCR alleging ineffective assistance of counsel, which you can do because of that, what, 2005, 2003, mm -hmm. whatever rule it says that you don't have to raise it on direct appeal. So on direct appeal where there's a guilty plea, I, I think there's already a lot of incentive. That's not to say that this, I, I think it's a bad idea what you were just talking about. Have problems with that too, same problem. But uh, at the same time, I still think that those concerns to some extent are addressed by the existing uh, waiver rules anyway, because you waive pretty much everything not intrinsic to the plea. Good points. Um, state public defender still thinks there's gonna be a, an impact on just, just on how attorneys are going to advise their client. And, and if there's an increase in the number of, of trials that actually occur, that, that will have an impact on how much money is, is required to operate the SPD and, uh, and pay indigent defense contract. This is why I don't go to the subcommittee meetings because I get drugged into these discussions and Doug can talk more freely about, about issues than I can. Now, that's not my role, but if I'm at a, at a subcommittee meeting, a lot of people ask, uh, ask me, well, what, what do you think? What's your opinion? And I, don't, I really don't want to 
<laughs> that's not my role. Moving on in the bill, uh, the bill, getting to this ineffective, prohibits ineffective assistant claims from being decided on direct appeal. The bill, yeah. Prohibits it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You got to do PCR. Yes. We already covered post, uh, guilty pleas. Uh, there's also some other issues on post conviction. You know, strikes a provision that requires a respondent uh, to the application for the post conviction to file an answer to the application with relevant portions of the record being challenged if the applicant fails to file the application without the record of the proceedings. So if the applicant doesn't have the record uh, in the application, uh, I read this, we were striking some language saying that the respondent has to respond to the uh, uh, to the application. It's, uh, Does that mean they have I think it puts the burden on the applicant to provide the record. Including the transcripts, which probably may not have been prepared. I gotta look at the provision we're striking here. Thank you. The language that's actually being stricken is if the application is not accompanied by the record of the proceedings challenged therein. Respondent shall file with the answer, with its answer, the record or portions thereof that are, are material to the questions raised in the application. We're striking that sentence. There's also some. There's also quite a few provisions about the state medical examiner. I think that's in response to a case, State v. Tyler, uh, about what can and cannot, what is admissible in a state medical examiner's report. Doug, do you have any comment on that or? Don't have comment yeah. on that one. There's uh, there's a provision in there, you know, 124.401 subsection five, which is the possession of a controlled substance section. We are numbering those unnumbered paragraphs in this section. However, there's also a provision in there, in, there's two provisions in there that you should be, you should know about. One is first offense, marijuana possession, is specifically, it's specified as a simple misdemeanor uh, if it's under five grams for possession of, of marijuana. Also, if you have a conviction out of state, you know, if you have multiple, as currently, if you have multiple possessions of marijuana or any controlled substance, you get enhanced penalties. Uh, under current law, if you have a conviction in Nebraska and you're in Council Bluffs under a new conviction for a possession charge in Nebraska and your council bluffs now and you have a possession conviction or charge in council bluffs or Iowa, your penalty can't be enhanced. This allows for the enhancement of possession of a possession charge if you have a conviction out of state. So the way there's uh, charges for marijuana and possession of marijuana, and the third can you be charged? Uh, you can be charged. This is not just for marijuana. This okay. The, the enhancement you, is not just for marijuana. But can you be charged as a third offense? Would it be? Well, I don't know. I'll go back and read the uh, statute on that. Okay. But I, I, I think I get your question. Is if if the, if the drugs are different? If you have a marijuana in Omaha, you have a marijuana possession charge, and in your council plus, you have a cocaine possession charge. I would say that that that. Omaha marijuana charge or Nebraska marijuana charge can be used to enhance your possession charge in Iowa. There's also a significant change in the vehicular homicide uh, section. Right now, it's it's if you are speeding, there's they, we list some code provisions here. You got to be violating these code provisions. But in, in essence, if you're going in excess of 30 miles an hour and you unintentionally cause the death of another person. That's vehicular homicide now. They're removing the recklessness portion of that. Uh, it's de facto. Yeah, it's strict. It's a strict liability. If you're going. So currently, if you 
like involuntary manslaughter, recklessness is written into that. Is the court has written in recklessness for into involuntary manslaughter, uh, and this this they debated this quite a bit in committee about what's recklessness, and it's it, you know it's up to you know it's a fact based scenario, but uh, they. As of right now, uh, the vehicular homicide, if you're going in excess of 30 miles an hour, was 25, they moved up to 30, uh, and you unintentionally cause the death of another, uh, it could potentially be vehicular homicide, a Class C felony. Then there's also some provisions at the very end of this. Apparently, some people, when they're serving on juries, you know, this doesn't really have to deal with, with criminal law, but People don't want to get their, they don't want to get their jury fee. They want to donate it. They want to donate the money. Or they don't want the money. So that money has to go somewhere. There's a provision at the, at the end of this bill that allows the court courts to donate. You can designate where you want your money to go. There's like six different. There's two uh, state funds they can go to: victim comp fund, court enhancement, technology fund, and then there's four other funds: uh, domestic violence fund. Uh, charities and whatnot, but that's at the end of that bill. Uh, Doug, do you have a oh, no, comment I'm, just, I'm remembering the days when we had to argue about the, uh, the, the tax returns and what three charities could be listed yes. on those. So I'm I, I we'll have arguments on I'm, which, which four charities can be listed to receive the, the money from the three people a year who want to do this. <laughs> Actually, it's, I heard it's, it's over, it's, I don't know how much money, but it's not, Five thousand dollars is more than that. But. Well, good, <laughs> good. I'm going to talk about a couple other bills that I've I'm familiar with. The, Did you touch on general verdicts on that? No. Do you want to talk about general verdicts? Um, gosh, if I can remember it, uh, they uh, they they change the law. This is in response to again another Supreme Court decision. Um, basically, it allows a jury to to not react to specific charges that were listed, but rule generally as to guilt. A general, a general verdict of guilt uh, without a specific um, jury instruction as to that. So kind of criminal defense attorneys, at least those who have come and testified, those who've responded to the Bar Association have great, uh, great pause with this, uh, since you're not directing the jury to specifically rule on uh, a particular um, cause of action that was brought, particular charge that was brought, just a general verdict of guilt. I see a lot of heads shaking. You know, a, lot, a lot of folks have problems with that. No just guilty. Okay. I, think, I think that's incorrect. I think it's the theory of the general. The th it I, would include lesser included. It would, wouldn't affect lesser included, but it it goes to the theories to convict somebody if it was multiple theories that were submitted like theft second has like you said 12 different ways to do that now you have to specify the jury would have to indicate which theory they found somebody mm -hmm. guilty under it would allow a general verdict for that but it wouldn't affect lesser included so. there they do not that's what, it eliminates. Yeah, that's what it eliminates right so that's because the court has reversed happen. cases where the alternative theories weren't clear which the jury didn't find. And then just a little legislative update on it. The bill is far from far from perfected. There were significant amendments coming out of the Senate. Um, there's there's disagreement on on how to handle simulated firearms, d disagreement on whether or not robbery third should be uh, retained. Uh, that's something Senator Kinney is is pretty uh, passionate about retaining uh, um, was it robbery third? Um, the House had a subcommittee on the bill yesterday. Uh, it was pretty clear that uh, uh, Representative Baltimore has concerns with uh, lots of provisions in the bill uh, that he believes will need to be tweaked. So we're we're not sure what what this bill is going to morph into. It's also become a catch-all. About half the half of the provisions that Joe referenced uh, appeared in other standalone bills uh, and and were brought into this bill as it was moving through the process. So more, more to come as it works its way through the House. The bill will die if it doesn't come out of committee uh, by next Friday. And I don't predict whether bills come out of committee or not. You just you I, don't know. I, I think it comes out. I think, I think it it's out? amended. Yeah. 
significantly. Okay, uh, there's a couple other bills. I'm just, well, there's a few more other. There's a few other bills. House File 2270, kidnapping in the second degree. There's a bill out there that makes it. Uh, it's kidnapping in the second degree automatically if the, if the victim is under 18. However, there's an exception if you're a parent or legal guardian, and you're kidnapping someone under under 18 for the sole purpose of establishing custody. So you essentially can't commit kidnapping in the second degree of your own child. There's another bill, House Senate File 2294. Uh, it's a needle exchange program. If you uh, if you do not commit uh, the criminal offense of possession of drug paraphernalia, if, if you possess a needle from a from an uh, established needle exchange program. There's also a bill, House File 2450, deals with DNA profiling. Uh, this adds, this is updates, adds clarity to the language. Um, it adds a provision that allows a defendant to request a hearing if a new method or technology uh, has emerged that is, that is substantially more probative than the previous DNA, DNA testing done in that, in that case. That's just a House file. There's not a Senate file on that. House Joint Re Resolution 2010. Doug, do you want to? That's Marcy's Law. Marcy's Law. There was an amendment just filed yesterday afternoon on that that changed that quite a bit. Uh, the there was some controversy on that. I don't know if you guys have been following that. That Marcy's Law. It's a constitutional amendment about victim rights. Uh, this one has uh, the victim has a right to be present at all proceedings, public proceedings involving involving the criminal case. There was some concern, I think, in the way it was drafted before about how how far what's a proceeding. They, yeah, what's a proceeding? How far can the victim? You know, can they be involved in plea discussions with the prosecutor, prosecution, and the defense attorney? Uh, and, and things like that. There, there's a definition. We're gonna. It refers to the definition of victim in the code, uh, the new the new amendment to that bill. Give give me an idea where this started out uh, in the in the original version, HJR 2007. One of the provisions. Uh, we'll 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 gauge everybody's uh, facial expression here. Sorry for those who are online. We won't get to see what your thoughts are. Uh, a victim shall have the right to refuse an interview, deposition or other discovery request made by the defendant or any person acting on behalf of the defendant. And, and victim includes anyone who is directly and proximately harmed by the commission of the criminal offense or delinquent act. So we have a broad definition of victim and you can't ask them any questions, can't interview them and can't depose them. Anybody think that might be, might have a few issues with it? That, that's no longer in the bill, but, uh, but that that's that's where we started out on this. I've drafted numerous variations of this amendment in the last month. It's changed quite a bit. Uh, did did they add back in? Sorry. There's a lot of the, the, actually there's a group promoting it. Uh, so so the the history on this that. the history on this is uh, a, a a billionaire. <laughs> who lost a sister to uh, murder uh, back in the 80s uh, while the offender, alleged perpetrator, uh, was out on bond. The mother and sister of the victim ran into the uh, alleged perpetrator at the grocery store. Okay. Based upon that, the billionaire has now decided that he's going to go across the country and get states to amend their constitution to provide ex this exhaustive list of victims' rights in their constitution with the hope of someday getting this into the United States Constitution. So there are six states that have passed this. One of those six, um, which is Montana, has uh, had their Supreme Court strike it down because it violated the single subject rule uh, when they passed it. Uh, so Iowa would be the sixth state uh, that would have a constitutional version, assuming our single subject rule didn't come into play. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, um, there have been letters to the editor on both sides. There have been ads in, in uh, 
online talking about why this is needed. Uh, there have been radio ads talking about why it's needed. There's a tremendous amount of money trying to push this into our constitution. So uh, it's, it's not just one legislator who had an idea. Uh, it's also been a series of interesting conversations. Uh, I'm sure we've all looked at chapter 915, pretty exhaustive list of victims' rights in there. Uh, we sat down with, uh, with the proponents of Marcy's Law and said, what, what's not covered in chapter 915? Well, it doesn't matter if it's covered in 915 or not. We just want it in the Constitution. If they had their way, I think they'd want their list plus everything in 915 written into the Constitution because the Constitution's enforceable and the statutes aren't. For those of you who wondered how that worked, now, now you know that pearl of wisdom that was used in a subcommittee. <laughs> But I think you also I think you get into the situation of whatever the issues with this particular thing, um, the danger of setting Iowa down the slippery slope of putting everything in the Constitution as well as some states have, you know, just to, Cor correct. Yeah. And and we're we're so not a referendum state, yeah. so that keeps us from having some of that happen as well. But your your point's very well taken. We've we pointed that out that you know should there be a need to change 915 and we don't think 915 has been changed since 1998, but if we want to add or subtract something to our victims' rights statute, it's it's a fairly easy process. It's very difficult to change the Constitution, uh, especially when we're dealing with victims' rights. So we're asking folks to be very careful as they move forward on that. Hence, Joe having to draft a bunch of amendments to get this thing narrowed down to accomplish its its goal. Uh, making sure that victims' rights are protected in the Constitution, but not have unintended consequences. Hopefully your latest draft does that. I have a question. Does the latest draft actually include the language that was missed between 2000, HJR 2003 and 2010? The original language stated affirmatively that it did not create a separate cause of action, but 210 lost that language. I. I'm pretty sure it, uh, it it does say it does not create a separate cause of action. I, Representing Baltimore was was uh, wanted to make sure that was in there. So yeah. glad he's done his homework. There's also another joint resolution, House Joint Resolution 2009, that uh, is the it, it says it's it, it mirrors the federal constitution with the Second Amendment somewhat. So it says the right to keep and bear arms. The, the people have, shall have the right to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. And uh, any law that's in contra, it, contra I, I can't go, it, it basically says that if, if the Supreme Court's gonna have to apply strict scrutiny to any laws that that impact that statement. Uh, that's how it's joint re resolution 2009. And that's out in both chambers. That's, so this, that's on the floor in the House, it's on the floor in the Senate. House file 2199, I think is by the only bill. I think that's been sent to the governor. Let's deal with possession or use of an illegal scanning, scanning skimming device. Uh, that wasn't very controversial. There's a, there was a few, the Senate had at all felonies. The House had one of, I think possession of the scanning device was a aggravated misdemeanor. Yes, possession and, with intent to use as a class D. Yes. And the, the the house took the house version. So one of them is a class D felony, and uh, the use of the of the skinning, skimming device is a class D felony, and just possession is a aggravated misdemeanor. House file twenty two fifty five is possession of contraband in a community based correctional facility. This is in response to a Iowa Supreme Court case where someone had possessed marijuana in a community based correction facility, and the Supreme Court. And I think rightfully said that a community-based correctional facility is not controlled by the, not under the control of the Department of Corrections, and therefore you cannot commit a viol you can you 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 cannot commit a violation of this section because a community-based correctional facility is not a correctional facility for purposes of the statute. This law changes that now. There's been some concern about about what is contraband because like a key. You know, normally if you have a key in a prison, that's contraband. So you have a key in a community-based correctional facility, is that going to be considered contraband? Uh, we did not change the definition of contraband. 
Another bill, House File 2401, passed the House, and this bill has a lot of a lot of provisions in it. Uh, mostly deal with uh, child endangerment, sex offenders. The, one of the big takeaways from this bill, from this House File 2401, is that Section 692A.128, the modification by sex offenders, that's basically been it's it's going to be almost impossible to for a sex offender once you're on the registry an adult to to modify the registra registration requirements that's that's one of the the takeaways from that bill um, Doug do you have anything on house file 2401 it makes it it criminalizes right now uh, uh, if you are a parent and you are you allow a sex offender access to your children uh, you could potentially commit child endangerment this also makes it child endangerment for, for the sex offender to knowingly knowingly have access, have access to to uh, a minor a child or a minor uh, certain minors in that case too that's what this bill does but there, that, I think those bills need some work because the Senate has a different version, the House has a different version. So I don't know what the outcome of that one. Wasn't that, gonna... that was the stuff that came out as originally as pre-files from DHS. Yes. They're trying to structure that. Yeah. There's multiple uh, versions of, of how this is drafted. Uh, and I think they're going to have to get together. And if they want to pass something, they're going to have to look at the language and, and a little bit more closely. There's another bill that creates lascivious conduct with a minor. This just passed the House yesterday or a couple of days ago. Uh, basically, uh, unlawful for any person 18 years of age or older who has uh, authority authority over a minor shall not uh, coerce someone to disrobe or partially disrobe for to arouse uh, the sexual desires of either of them. The concern there was, uh, I think Representative Wolf brought it up on the floor, that if you're a supervisor at McDonald's, a 19-year-old supervisor, and you have a relationship with uh, a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old at McDonald's, and you have supervisor, supervisor, supervisory authority over that person, you could potentially, uh, you, you would be in violation of, uh, of this <laughs> section. Uh, that was one of the concerns that she brought up on that. County attorneys have said there's a there's a hole in the in the in the prosecutorial uh, toolboxes, uh, so to speak. Uh, some of these offenses are slipping through the cracks, and this would give them some ability to prosecute some offenses that they think should have should be punishable by a more severe offense. Um, and they add to it, so they they have aggravated serious aggravated and serious uh, based upon where you touched the particular individual. So they, they try and provide that structure. Yeah. Uh, Sanctuary Cities is another bill that uh, has, has, has got a lot of attention with the legislature and, and in the press. This bill essentially, if, if ICE puts a detainer on an individual that's in jail, has been arrested, they're in jail, once their sentence is done, the the county, the jail has to hold that person for up to 48 hours. They can hold them up to 48 hours. If they don't do that, then they're going to lose their funding. And the big question is, what's that mean? You know, what's the funding? Funding for what? Uh, that's an issue I think that's in uh, that's in contra that's a controversial issue. And I think some sheriffs think a detainer they need a court order. If I'm going to hold somebody in my jail, I need a court order. A detainer is not a, a signed by a judge. It's not a court order. I I I need some more protection. So that's another issue. In, in, in well, that and then bill. whether or not it comes in writing, and and there's also a provision in there that allows anybody at the uh, at the facility facility sua sponte to say we need to hold this person another 48 hours. Those adds adds some questions as to liability on behalf of the the governmental entity that's holding them. Yes. Federal immigration law, have they tried anything like that? 
this would be the closest bill to closest that. Bill. In, in order for a, a state, a non-federal entity to right. enforce immigration law, you need to have an agreement with the federal government right. and, and have specific training uh, in order to do that. Right. So the legislature hasn't, hasn't touched that. Hasn't tried that one, okay. Doug, do you have any, do you have some bill, you wanna take a few bills we'll, here? We'll take, a, we'll take a few bills here and, and make sure we stay on time. Um, so we've given you a packet of all the bills that the Bar Association's been tracking, uh, provided a little, little note on the side as to whether or not they're still alive, funneled, uh, what chamber they bounced back and forth with. So if you, if you wanna go through that and look at the title, uh, you can then pull them up on the legislative website and, and see the uh, see the information on that bill and see if you have uh, have concerns or want to want to be supportive of it um, Going down the list of bills that we have here. We've already talked about the license revocation um, Well, we'll start with the budget Today is the day for the the March revenue estimating conference. I, I know you've all been waiting to, for that day to come uh, The March revenue estimating conference tells the legislature how much money they have to spend uh, if it's lower than the December revenue estimating conference. If it's higher, uh, the legislature doesn't have more money to spend. That just means more money rolls into the, uh, into the cash reserve. But if it's lower, they have to adjust their numbers down. There's been a lot of, uh, of thoughts either way on whether or not this number is gonna be higher or lower than the December number. Uh, the more important part to it is if they look at the current fiscal year and decide uh, we need to have a deappropriation. The December Revenue Estimating Conference stated that we needed to have a $34 million deappropriation. Uh, at one point, the Senate was looking at a $4.6 million cut to the judicial branch alone as part of that $34 million hit. Um, right now, both chambers and the governor are looking at a $1.6 million hit to the judicial branch uh, if they have to do a deappro if the March REC is better than the December REC, and we have reason to believe it's going to be better, uh, we may actually not have the DPRO for the judicial branch, which would save us from court closures. Yes, sir. Are you talking about, what about the state public defender budget? The state public defender budget in all of those bills uh, is going to receive $1.7 million more going towards indigent defense contracts. So they're, they're actually talking about deappropriating money and while deappropriating money kicking in 1.7 into uh, indigent defense contracts to make sure that they cover their bills. Good question. Um, we've talked about expungements. We're uh, moving through. Uh, we didn't, weren't sure if this was going to pick up or not as uh, uh, House File 2465, a uh, body camera study. Uh, the last time we talked about body cameras, I believe, was five sessions ago. And... Uh, uh, how they how they were going to treat those, and uh, the legislature uh, could not agree between the House and Senate, and killed both of their versions of the bill. And they've not uh, not brought anything up on how to handle that public record since. Uh, so now they're going to uh, they're looking at putting a study together, actually possibly having the bar association facilitate that uh, that study committee uh, to bring people in and and work through how we should handle that information. Uh, Item D, so 1D, reinstatement of voting rights for felons. Uh, that, that was actually a bill that would have created a process for that. Uh, as it came up in committee, it was amended to be a study uh, to, to create a more streamlined process for reinstating uh, voting rights in Iowa. Uh, this is included in the omnibus bill, but item 1E, a decrease in penalties for marijuana. Uh, sets the cap at five grams, so anything less than five grams would be a simple misdemeanor. So that's a, now a standalone bill, and it's included in the omnibus bill. Uh, juvenile, uh, this reform on how they handle juvenile records. Uh, this has been a priority of the court. Uh, they have a very lengthy bill. I don't know if you've been lucky enough to draft that one. Uh, very lengthy, spent about three months going back and forth with groups trying to perfect the language. Uh, on, on sealing records and when they can be accessed. Uh, bill has moved out of the House uh, House now and, and has moved over to the Senate. It was handled yesterday, uh, moving through. For anybody practicing in Des Moines, uh, there's been a hole in the current way that those records are handled uh, that did not allow um, juvenile assistant pro assistance programs to receive the records to be able to handle the individuals. So 
in Des Moines because of the way uh, it was being interpreted. The records were not uh, being turned over by the court. Uh, there's now language in there that would fix that. Uh, under item two, strengthening sex crimes and child abuse laws, Joe's covered several of those. Um, let's see, we've got a, a human trafficking bill, uh, item C, uh, SF 2371. It takes, um, it takes uh, it from a class C felony to a class B felony if you're involved in the trafficking of an individual or if you threaten the individual with violence uh, to keep them to stay, uh, stay with you or you threaten to withhold financial support. So think about all the ways that you try and keep a young person under your thumb. Uh, this takes that from being a class C felony to a class B felony because it would be part of trafficking that individual. Uh, item 2E, eliminating the statute of limitations for sex abuse to a minor. So right now it's uh, a 10 year statute of limitations. If you're a, or if you're a minor, it's 10 years from the date you turn 18. Uh, there's also a caveat in there for three years. If there's D DNA evidence, you'd have three years once you get the DNA evidence to bring that charge. Complete, this bill completely removes the statute of limitations. So 50 years after, after the act, uh, you could have somebody who's brought up on charges on that. Um, don't, don't know if the evidence might be stale by then, uh, but apparently the legislature in moving this forward uh, believes that we'll be able to have all sorts of evidence and witness testimony and everybody will have a, a great recollection of how those facts actually went down. So uh, obviously from the tone of my voice or comments, we, we think somewhere between 10 and forever, uh, we could find a compromise in this. Uh, sex acts with uh, juvenile detention centers, you covered that, didn't you? No. Uh, so this, this one adds, uh, uh, it changes it from an aggravated to a uh, class D felony if you have sexual acts with anybody if you're so if you're a detention officer you're someone working at the facility um, judicial officer if you're engaged in sexual acts with someone who's in that uh, facility it changes it from an aggravated to a felony uh, new crimes eluding uh, now you can uh, they can, under this bill, so the uh, Senate file 2343, if you use your vehicle to elude officers or they believe you were eluding under this bill, they would be able to keep your vehicle until the conclusion of all criminal uh, charges involved in this. Haven't been able to figure out exactly what they're after on this one, but if, you're, if your name is on the title, you lose the car as long as the criminal proceedings are going on. Yes, sir. Don't believe that was addressed in a question was, could they, could they search the vehicle? They, they, they have possession of the vehicle. It, and if they're gonna go further than that, they'd have to comply with what's existing. Uh, car theft, um, let's see, this takes it to a class B felony. Uh, so, so if it's over $10,000, they step that up fairly highly. We talked about simulated firearms. Not only is that in the uh, omnibus bill, but it's in a separate bill. Uh, one that has gone through one chamber and has is actually what they deferred on it critical in the House, critical infrastructure sabotage. Uh, think back to what was in the paper when we, when we uh, had protesters on the pipeline being built across Iowa, uh, and some folks uh, went and damaged the Iowa Utility Board sign. Okay, but they also then, after they damaged that sign, they were uh, smart enough to tell people that they'd gone out with drills to try and take care of that pipeline and some people had taken shots at it. Uh, this, is, this is a bill brought forth by uh, Homeland Security to talk about protecting critical infrastructure. It's a very broad definition of critical infrastructure. Arguably, it could include an a, a interstate highway includes anything having to do with broadband infrastructure, not just so, and pipelines, both gas, gas and oil, uh, anything with electric, all of those items fall under critical infrastructure. Uh, tampering, damaging critical infrastructure is a class B felony with an 85,000 to $100,000 downstroke if you do it. 
they are loaded for bear on this thing. So somebody who wants to do something they think is, is cute as a protest could all of a sudden have themselves a class B felony and uh, an $85,000 fine on them. So uh, not that you'd be advising someone on how to handle that, but uh, they, they certainly could get themselves spun up. Yes, sir. I have a question. I lay off the left. We have a bet, but I sit on the legislative subcommittee with John and Andrea Mason, and you know, you send us this legislation to look at, and we try to come to a consensus and opine back to you. Yes. But initially, wasn't the wasn't the minimum fine egregiously large, and then there was a maximum fine that was even more egregiously large than that? Is, yes. So now, now the current version is just. 85,000 to 100 85 85,000 to 100,000 that's it that's the range okay I don't know if that falls in your idea of egregious yes. or not yes sir. it does okay <laughs> but of course it's a piece of, but of course of course there is a twist on that too the waterways I think water the agriculture community uh, Farm Bureau has gotten interested in this bill because of uh, I think there's been some concerns about what, what if someone unintentionally pollutes something, you know, if you sabotage a Des Moines Waterworks, you know, that would fall under this yes. bill. If you do something to Des Moines Waterworks. So then the concern was about what about people, you know, can someone come back on a farmer or homeowner or something, uh, putting something in the waterway. So there's all kinds of exceptions uh, for that in this bill too. Yes. I, and I, Still think they're they're thinking through what this means, but it, it did move quite quickly through the through the Senate. Now it's now it's in the House, it's out of committee, and and they're working on perfecting it. But I I believe we will have a bill. Uh, this may not be the final version of it, but uh, they 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 are pretty serious about this one. And in the last couple couple minutes, just because they're they're fun ideas, is there a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead. You're, you're more important. What's the question? I've got more important. Well, the, the quick question is this. Every year I'm mildly surprised by some of the things Joe brings to us. This year I'm slack-jawed. Um, and our legislative subcommittee, we try to come to a consensus and, and make recommendations. And I know some of the members of the committee have come to the Capitol to, mm -hmm. you know, appear before these subcommittees and speak. Uh, we don't always come to a consensus because it's an even split of prosecutors and defense lawyers. Um, are we helping you at all this year? I mean, it... I've never been so pessimistic in my 38 years uh, of practicing law. You know, if, if, if you me, look at the years. if you look at the list of bills we provided you, and you see the number of them that are funneled or on life support, I think is the term I use on that. Yeah. That means you've helped us. Okay. Because the information that we get back, uh, we're able to go and we everything that's on that list, we've been at the subcommittees for. Okay. And and have provided your input to the legislators serving on that. Um, are are all of these ready to become law? No, uh, it takes a process, and and we hopefully uh, are able to keep things that are that are really really bad for Iowa, not not bad for defendants or or bad for county attorneys. Things that are bad for Iowa are what we're trying to keep from happening. And yes, what you what you do is vitally important and very helpful. Okay. Uh, a couple of the of the of the more interesting ones, and we oh, another question. Yes, sir. I've had the same reaction that Al had, and I'm just wondering if you could give us some kind of insight on what the motivation for all of this is. Uh, normally, uh, a, a legislator will, will have a personal experience or someone with a personal experience will come to them and say, hey, you know, this very specific fact scenario happened, and I think that's wrong. How can we address it? Okay, there's one here on the, on the interesting bills on prostitution, okay? How do you get rid of prostitution? Well, that's easy. They have to forfeit their automobile, and within 24 hours of being charged, it has to be published in the local newspaper, okay? So if you're gonna go solicit a prostitute, be sure and drive your 1982 Chevy Camaro that's all rusted out because you could be forfeiting that vehicle. Don't take your Lexus. But they're, they're, they've, they've decided I, I want to be as aggressive as I possibly can and the poor drafters have to take these thoughts and put them into a bill. So, you know, here I want to make sure that the public knows about it. And I want to make sure we get their car. Imagine 150 folks having 
depending on Senator or, or House, a House member having 30,000 constituents, 30,000 different ideas that could come to them on how to handle one specific fact scenario, and you get a bill to address one thing that blows up. There's another one here, uh, item C under stupid ideas. I'm sorry, I didn't call it stupid ideas. That was my interesting thoughts here. Uh, item 4C, secret sex offender registry, okay? If you have come off, what this bill would have done is if you came off the sex offender registry and you moved into an area, the sheriff would still have a sex offender registry that you would have to tell them about. It wouldn't be public, but the sheriff would know about it. I, I see some gasp, yes. So if you were convicted outside the state of Iowa, had never been on the registry, uh, so say you were convicted in Louisiana and you had to be on the registry for 10 years, 15 years have passed, so you've been off the registry for five years, you come to Iowa, this bill would require you to register with the sheriff and let them know where you were living and that you had previously been on a sex offender registry. I know that sounds perilously close to you're still on a sex offender registry, uh, in, in sort of giggle here. You know, that, that was it. The fact scenario there, gentleman had moved into a neighborhood from out of state. He was a sex offender. The neighbors eventually found out he'd been a sec, on a sex offender list, and they were aghast that they did not have any knowledge of it, and, and they think everybody should know that he was a sex offender, but since they can't let everybody know, we should just let the sheriff know so the sheriff can keep an eye on him, even though he's completed his sentence. One very specific fact scenario, driving what the legislator submitted for a bill. We're out of time, Joe tells me. Thank you very much. Enjoy your Friday.